Hello. Hi, Eric. How are you doing? Good. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. I was mm -hmm. just starting to get worried whether I had the right link or not. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I kind of lost track of time. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, I was just going through the emails, realizing, oh, wait, you're not getting these <laughs> these uh, emails. It's going to our mailing list. <laughs> oh, no, no. I got them. I got them. Good. All right. Good, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, how is the school? How is the semester going? Great. Uh, fun. Are you teaching? <laughs> no, not this term. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's uh, one last bit of research focus until mm -hmm. I get distracted again by teaching next yeah, year. Yeah. Right. <laughs> what classes do you usually teach? Uh, so next term, I'm going to have one undergrad class just introducing the theory of computation. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm going to try some new things in that one uh, this time. And I have a graduate course where I'm going to try to do the probabilistic method for computer scientists. Oh, nice. Uh, I don't know if you ever had the chance to go through that book. It's a really fun book, the Alon Spencer I, book. Yeah, I actually took a class with Naga Alon that was oh, on the book. Nice. Um, that was cool. <laughs> Wait, yeah. so I should get you to come here to teach my, the course oh, instead. Oh, my God. <laughs> I feel like even secondhand from what Noga taught is still going to be miles yeah. better than what I'm going to do. But I mean, uh, I was an undergrad at the time, so I don't know <laughs> how much I absorbed. But yeah, yeah, it was definitely one of the highlights of undergrad. Nice. Uh, yeah. How big was that class? I'm trying to picture what it'd be like. Pretty big. Yeah. Um, mostly graduate students. Uh, I'd say like 30 people. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a lot for <laughs> yeah, for yeah. mostly graduate students. Yeah, Princeton had this thing where graduate students never had to do homework. I don't think they were even graded. Uh, nice. So at least the people doing homeworks were like five <laughs> from other. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah uh, this is one of the things I wish we did also here. Uh, not Not having homework. No, or not having grades anyways for graduate mm. students. I don't know how it is at Boston. Yeah, we have grades and weekly homeworks. And... <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the weekly homework, that's okay. That can be good. Like for some classes like this one, the probabilistic method, you'll get nothing out of it if you just go and listen to lectures. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. But, uh, so. but at the same time, you shouldn't be doing it for grades. You shouldn't have to think about grades at all anymore is my philosophy. Yeah. Yeah, I Wait, this is being stopped. recorded. I shouldn't say anything. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> yeah, I did personally kind of stop thinking about grades. Um, so. I think that's the right thing. Yeah, yeah, it's the right priorities. Yeah. Let me see what time it is. Okay. So it is 12.30. I expect... A few more. I expect it's going to take a few more minutes for people to show up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I also don't know how many people we're going to get. This has been up and down with especially in-person and then online and then in-person again. And then mm. uh, uh, we currently have a lot of infections in the area. So they're kind of going back to like oh. the, people have to wear masks if they go on campus even. So I don't even know how many people are going to be going to campus. I see. So yeah, it's fun. Lots of unpredictable things. <laughs> yeah, I guess we're still having to adapt. What about you? I, I've heard from Sofia that things were like back to normal a long time ago. Yeah, BU got, I mean, people were going to the office many years ago now, it feels yeah, like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm currently actually in California because I'm doing an internship. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah. So you can't be in the office right now. <laughs> uh, I am in the a office. Bit, right or now. a different office. Different office. <laughs> different office, yeah. So where are you right now? At Amazon. Okay. Yeah. Where are they in California? So is it San Francisco or the Bay Area? I'm in the Bay Area. So this office is in Santa Clara. They have so many okay. offices apparently in the Bay Area, including San Francisco. I see. Yeah. Which I was see. surprising. I didn't even know. <laughs> Surprising that they have an office in San Francisco itself? No, just surprising that they have like four offices in the area. Yeah. That's a lot. And how long have you been there? Are you there for the term or? 
Yeah, I started in September and I'm staying until the middle of December. Nice. And how do you like it? Uh, it's been good. So I don't know if I'm getting a real industry experience. I'm just doing a research project that's very theoretical and it's pretty much similar to my PhD. <laughs> That's Just good to hear. That's heartening. So even at Amazon, they care about theoretical computer science enough to let you. Yeah, I was research. I was very surprised. Yeah, the team that I'm part of does like half just research that they care about, and half they have to do something else to get paid. I guess, but you get to be on the good half. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I don't think I could help them on the other half. So. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah, they get a lot of interns to do this research usually. So, hmm. and how how did you get that position? Did uh, the person you know who I'm, yeah, Shiva Kasivisvaratan, uh, he used to work with Adam and Sofia on privacy, differential privacy. So the project I'm doing is in privacy now. Very nice. Yeah, yeah, it's been good. Like even if I'm not doing anything industry related, it's been good to like see what the setup is and how people choose what they work on. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I've never done this. I've never actually mm. worked in industry with research. So it's a, it, it's a very mysterious thing to me right now. I can't even picture it. <laughs> yeah, I guess in the US it's becoming quite common for a lot of companies to have some like just like theoretical research that they support. Um, well, I guess it's like, I guess it's like it's always been just ups and downs. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They've definitely had lots of history of doing this as well in the past at various times. And then, yeah, and then giving up once right, the, <laughs> the <of> funding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I guess my team does causality, like, causal inference and that can be like pretty useful in practice but you kind of have to like fight to like get yourself involved in projects and like convince people that your methods are useful right um, so I guess it is still a bit like academia where you have to convince people about your research being valuable <laughs> Yeah, except that you really can't use the good for society yeah, arguments. It exactly. really has to be the dollars and cents. It actually has to be useful. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Uh, okay. We do have a small group, but it has been five minutes. Uh, mm -hmm. So what I recommend is that we slowly think sharing. about getting started. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let me see. Okay. I'll just... um, you can see my zoomed in screen, right? Yes. Okay. Yep, I think that looks perfect on my end. Okay, great. And I have to ask a really embarrassing basic question to start uh, before I can even introduce you. Yeah. Is it Aiden or? It's Eden. And Eden, yeah. See, I was gonna is... go wrong. <laughs> yeah. And the and last, the last name, is... name is Kalemai. Kalemai. Yeah. Eden Kalemai. Yeah. <laughs> Good. So, Eden, it's great to have you here for our seminar. Uh, yeah. We've yeah. got, like I said, a small group, but all three, uh, all four uh, people that we have here are very much in the area. Oh, of, great. Uh, uh, either differential privacy or sublinear algorithms or both. Uh, I think actually maybe both or even actually oh, perfect. So isoparametric inequalities. We have some experts about this in the area. So we're all actually really excited to hear about what you have nice. to tell us. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. Um, so this work is on isoparametric inequalities for real valued functions. Um, motivated by applications to monotonicity testing. And it's joint work with Hadley Black at UCLA and Sofia Arasonikova, who's my advisor at BU. So the starting point for this work is a series of inequalities uh, for Boolean functions defined on the hypercube domain. Uh, we call the domain zero one to the D the hypercube. 
In 74 and 93, Margulis and Telegram proved two inequalities for Boolean functions on the undirected hypercube. And later on, motivated by applications to monotonicity testing, Chakrabarti and Sashadri generalized the inequality of Margulis to the directed hypercube, where now the edges have directions, and called Minzer Safra generalized the inequality of Talagrand. In this work, we generalize all of these inequalities to real valued functions on the hypercube domain. Our motivation is one to understand the structure of real valued functions on the hypercube. These are significantly less studied than Boolean functions on the hypercube and also to improve sublinear algorithms for monotonicity. The plan for this talk is that I'll first explain what new results on monotonicity testing we obtained thanks to these generalized inequalities. Then I'll give some background on the Boolean inequalities, explain what our new inequality looks like, and then I'll uh, try to prove how we generalize this inequality depending on time. I'll start with some preliminaries uh, about just notation that we're going to use through this talk. So the main subject of the talk is the d-dimensional hypercube um, that looks like this for three dimensions. And for each vertex of the hypercube, we give it a function value. It has two to the d vertices. And an edge x to y is such that uh, x and y differ only in one bit from zero to one, and they uh, are the same in all other bits. We'll say that a function is monotone if the value of the function f along every edge does not decrease. We'll call edges influential if the value of f along the edge changes. And we'll say that the edge is violated if the value of the function along that edge decreases. So in this case, by violation, we mean violation to monotonicity. The distance to monotonicity is a very commonly studied quantity for those who study monotonicity testing. Um, it's defined, in, at least for this talk, as the least number of values of f that need to be changed to make the function monotone. So in this case, uh, here's a real valued function on the hypercube. There's no violated edges. They're all either increasing or constant. So the distance of, the, of f to monotonicity is zero. Whereas this function is not monotone, these three edges in red are violated. And to make the function monotone, I could change these three values. Uh, so the distance of the function to monotonicity is three. And notice that I have to change at least three values because I have a matching of three violated edges. And to make the function monotone, I have to change at least one value for these edges in the matching. And in this case, the three, uh, suffice to make the function monotone. The algorithmic tasks we consider for this talk are to monotonicity testing and approximating distance to monotonicity. Monotonicity testing was first studied by Rubinfeld Sudan, Goldray Golvaseron, and Goldray Golvaseron, Lehmann, and Samorodnitsky. An algorithm for monotonicity testing is given oracle access to a function f, and it makes queries to this function of the form, what is the value of the function at the point X of the hypercube? And it also has some parameter epsilon between zero and one. And the goal of the function of the algorithm is to accept if the function is monotone and rejects with high probability if the function is far from monotone. So the distance of the function to monotonicity is at least epsilon times two to the D. Or, uh, a more generalized task is that of approximating distance to monotonicity, which was first studied by Parnas, Ron Rubinfeld, and Fatal Ron for monotone functions. Uh, in this case, the algorithm is given our uh, oracle access to some function f with the promise that it has some lower bound on its distance to monotonicity, where this lower bound is via this parameter alpha. And the goal of the algorithm is to output some estimate epsilon hat on the distance to monotonicity. We say that the function achieves a C approximation if the estimate epsilon hat achieves a multiplicative factor C approximation of the distance to monotonicity. And I'll also note that this guarantee 
on the on a lower bound of the distance to monotonicity can be turned into just an additive error. So you don't need this promise. So I'll explain uh, what results on monotonicity testing are known and what are our new results. So this has been an extensively studied problem and I don't think these are even all of the relevant references. And uh, as a reminder, we're looking at functions on the hypercube domain and we'll call R the number of distinct values of uh, the range of F. For Boolean functions, Kot Minzer Safra, who generalized the Telegrand inequality, showed that you can test monotonicity of Boolean functions with root D, square root of D over epsilon squared queries. Uh, in this talk, we mostly care about the dependence on the dimension. And this matches the lower bound of root D for non-adaptive algorithms. These are algorithms that make uh, all of their queries in advance. So their queries don't depend on answers to previous queries. And there's actually a question about whether adaptivity helps in testing monotonicity. So currently the best lower bound is D to the one third by Chen, Weingarten and Xi. For real valued functions, the best no uh, upper bound was uh, due to Chakrabarty and Sashadri who gave an algorithm that makes order of D queries. And we improve this, uh, at least for the case uh, when R is small with respect to D, to give an algorithm that has query complexity R root D. So we kind of interpolate between this result of Kotmins or Safra for Boolean functions and this result of Chakrabarty and Sashadri um, to show that you can sort of tailor the result to like the number of distinct values of F. And for non-adaptive algorithms that make the one-sided error, um, the upper bound matches the lower bound. Um, one-sided error, it means that the function always, that the algorithm always has to accept when the function is monotone. And our algorithm is non-adaptive and has one-sided error. Okay, so these are the results on monotonicity testing. Um, right, and then I'll just say that we obtained this new, uh, we obtained this upper bound on monotonicity testing thanks to our generalized uh, telegram inequality. Um, for distance approximation, um, the best uh, known upper bound for Boolean functions was thanks to Pala Vorasonikova and Weingarten, who gave an approximate. Uh, so in this case, we're going to care about the approximation factor rather than the query complexity. And Pala Vorasonikova and Weingarten gave an approximation algorithm that achieves root D log D factor approximation. And they also show a uh, lower bound for non-adaptive algorithms um, of root D factor. For real valued function, uh, the previous best result was due to Fatal and Ron, who gave an algorithm that has D log R factor approximation. And we improve this to give an algorithm that achieves root D log D factor approximation. So there's no dependence on R, and this is the same as the factor approximation for Boolean functions. Um, and as I said, we mostly care about the approximation factor, but the query complexity of all of this algorithm is polynomial in the domain size. I think you had a question, Eric. That was going to be my question. So, so this was uh, the C factor in your definition. Uh, for distance approximation, you had the alpha parameter, the C mm -hmm. parameter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. This is the C, so the what factor of approximation are you achieving? And are we thinking of alpha as a constant here or? Uh, yeah, I think of alpha as like a small constant. Okay, good. Yeah. Mm, all right. Um, okay, so these are all our uh, improved results in monotonicity uh, testing. Um, I'm not going to go into the algorithms. They are similar to algorithms for the Boolean case, um, but the missing ingredients in obtaining all of these results is generalizing this isoperimetric inequalities to the case of real valued functions. 
So now I'll start with some background on the inequalities that were known for Boolean valid functions. Um, I'll start first with the undirected case. So now my hypercube has no directions on the edges. And in the undirected case, we'll care about these edges that we call influential, um, which are the edges along which the value of f changes. And for each vertex x, we, did not, uh, we define this quantity if of x, which is the number of influential edges at the, at the vertex x. And because we don't want these uh, edges to be double counted, we're only going to count them um, where the function value is one. Okay. So when you can define this quantity of boundary vertices, which are um, the vertices that have some positive influence. And these quantities are called isoperimetric because we can think of a Boolean function as the indicator function for like a subset of the hypercube. And the goal of this inequality is, is to bound, uh, to give some relationship between the volume of the set and the boundary of the set given by the Boolean function. So Talagrand showed that for any Boolean function f, the sum of the quantities square root of the influences at each vertex is lower bounded by the variance of the function times two to the d. So in this case, we think of the variance as some sort of volume for this uh, set given by the Boolean function. So uh, variance is defined as uh, the uh, p0 times one minus p0, where p0 is the fraction of zeros of the function. And then this quantity uh, that is lower bounded is uh, sort of like a complicated measure of like uh, the boundary of the set, because we're looking at the edges that come out of this boundary. And this quality, uh, inequality of Telegram was a generalization of a quantity of an inequality by Margulis, who showed that for a Boolean function f, the number of influential edges times the number of boundary vertices um, when normalized the property is lower bounded by the square root of, by the square of the variance. Um, it's not immediate to see why Telegrams is stronger than Margulis, but um, yeah, the Margulis inequality follows by the Telegram one. Um, so now we'll switch to the directed case where we give directions to the edges of the hypercube. And in this case, recall that we're interested in this violated edges, which are the edges along which the value of the function decreases. And we'll similarly denote a quantity violations of f at x, which is the number of violated edges at x. And then so we don't double count edges, we only count the outgoing violated edges at x. So for this point, uh, here, we have two outgoing violated edges. And again, we'll define boundary vertices as those points which have uh, non, which have positive violation value. So they have some violated edges incident on them. Motivated by monotonicity testing, Kotminzer and Safra showed that for a Boolean function f, um, the sum of the quantities square root of the violations of f at x is lower bounded by the distance of the function to monotonicity. So this inequality looks very similar to the inequality of Talagrand. We're replacing the number of influential edges with the number of violated edges, and the variance of the function is being replaced by distance to monotonicity, which turns out to be the equivalent uh, quantity in the directed case. This inequality of Kotmin's or Safra was, uh, is a strengthening of an inequality by Chakravarti and Sashadri, who also motivated by monotonicity testing showed that for a Boolean function f, the number of violated edges times the number of boundary vertices is lower bounded by the distance of f to monotonicity squared. Um, and it was Chakravarti and Sashadri who had this insight uh, that you go from variance to distance to monotonicity when you're looking at the directed case of these inequalities. Okay, so Actually, now mm -hmm. can we go back to it just because we'll be talking about these inequalities quite yeah. a bit. Now I'm stuck on why 
The first inequality implies the second one. I'm trying to remember it. I think it's not too complicated, right? We can do it in the directed or undirected case. Uh, uh, it's like, a, I think it's a cautious words inequality. That's it, right? So yeah. number yeah, yeah. of boundary vertices is going to be the number of terms in your sum that you have that are non-zero. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, you just actually, you just apply the cautious schwartz inequality and um, you obtain the, um, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, then you get sum of one for that many terms times yeah. the sum of the influences, all of that square root. So that's mm -hmm. why we get. Yeah. Just an excuse to spend a bit more time looking at those two. <laughs> yeah, 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 that makes sense. Um, all right. Okay, so I'm going to show you what our inequalities look like for real valued functions. Uh, well, they're going to look the same. So um, in the directed case, uh, we show that the same inequality for Boolean functions also holds for real valued functions. So again, the square, uh, the sum of the square root of the violations at each vertex is lower bounded by the distance of the function to monotonicity. Uh, and recall that this quantity is defined as the number of outgoing violated edges at x. And there's no dependence on the size of the range of the function. Uh, and we also look at the undirected case. This is more just for curiosity rather than for algorithmic purposes. Um, but it turns out that in the undirected case, the quantity you should look at uh, for the lower bound is distance of the function to a constant rather than variance. Um, and actually, the distance of a function to a constant is with, uh, within a factor of two of variance for Boolean functions. Um, so if you go back to the undirected Boolean inequality, you can write it with distance of f to constant. Um, and then just for clarity, the distance of a function to the constant is the number of values that you need to change to make the function constant. But uh, for this talk, we're going to be focusing on the directed inequality. It's the one that we use for all of our applications to monotonicity testing. And it implies all the other inequalities in this mentioned in this talk. Um, and uh, I'll show how to prove it. But first, I'll, uh, uh, yeah, I'll show how to prove it. Can, can I ask yeah. for the yeah. undirected case? Mm -hmm. Are there any other similar type of inequalities that are known for non-Boolean valued functions from before? Mm, like, not, or not that I know of, and like, it's very similar to them, no. I find that very surprising in a way, like it, these mm -hmm. isoparametric inequalities, like the Telegram inequality is so Nice, so natural that it yeah. should have been studied by people who don't even care about monotonicity testing. Right, very right, much. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, okay. um, yeah, somehow real valued functions don't get as much love as <laughs> the Boolean ones. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so, yeah, just because as Eric said, we'll spend a lot of time looking at this inequality, I just wanted to give you some examples of like what's happening with this inequality. So let's first look at like one function. Uh, its distance to monotonicity is three because if I change this three points, I can make it monotone. And then each of these points that need to be changed um, to make the function monotone, each contribute at least one violated edge. Um, so, um, we know that this quantity on the right, which is the sum of the square root of the violations, is going to be at least three, which is the distance to monotonicity. In this case, it's a bit larger because some vertices contribute at least two edges. So this is the sort of the easy case where each uh, vertex that needs to be changed to make the function monotone actually has some violated edge incident on it. But this is not always the case. So in this case, for this function, the distance of to monotonicity is four. Um, you could either change the four like vertices on 
this side or the four vertices on this other side, it's equivalent. Um, and not all vertices that need to be changed contribute some violated edge. So this vertex in the corner here doesn't contribute any violated edges, but the vertices in the middle contribute enough violated edges that you still get this lower bound by four. So each contributes at least two violated edges. Um, and kind of what's happening is because you have this like long range violation between this vertex in the corner here to these other vertices in the middle and also in the top, um, this vertex in the corner is kind of like sending violations, uh, more, sending more violations in the middle. Um, and the inequality still holds. Um, okay. Um, so to show you how we're, we're going to prove this inequality for real valued functions, uh, we're going to prove it by reducing to the Boolean case. And to do so, we'll need a Boolean decomposition theorem, which is actually the key technical tool um, of our paper. And the Boolean decomposition theorem we're going to prove is going to work for every partially ordered domain uh, with, so these are posets, which we represent by a directed acyclic graph. And uh, you can study monotonicity testing on any poset, not just like hypercube. And this has been studied by Fisher, Lemma, Newman, Raskolnikova, and Rubinfeld. And the definitions are all the same. There's a set of vertices, a set of edges, and uh, we'll say that X is below Y if there is some directed path from X to Y. And you define violated edges similarly. Okay, so this is just to say that our, um, um, our tool for reducing from the real valued case to the Boolean case works for all kinds of faucets, not just the hypercube. So here's um, the Boolean decomposition theorem that we proved that is gonna help us reduce to the uh, Boolean case so that will denote by violations of f all of the violated edges of a function. Then we show that if we start with any poset and we have a function defined on this poset that is a non monotone function, then for some integer k, we can decompose our function into Boolean functions f1 through fk defined on the same set uh, on the same poset. Um, and also there exists uh, disjoint subgraphs H1 through HK of the uh, original poset such that these new Boolean functions, uh, collectively they preserve the distance to monotonicity of the original function, except for a loss of a factor of two. And all of the violations of the new Boolean functions are a subset of the violated edges of the original function. And moreover, all of these violations are going to be contained in the subgraphs HI. So this last quantity just says that all of the individual violations for the functions FI are disjoint of it, uh, from each other. Um, I wanna give you like a picture of this theorem to just keep in mind for the rest of the talk. So theorem is saying, uh, I can start with my hypercube um, oh, okay, so I'm going to use diamonds for the rest of the talk to represent the hypercube. Um, and in this diamonds, the edges go, the paths go from like the bottom to the top. So this is the all zeros vertex. This is the all ones vertex. Okay, so I can start with my hypercube and then I can find disjoint locations of the hypercube. So that if these are the edges violated by my original function, then I can define uh, like in this case, three new functions that are Boolean, whose violated edges are all contained in this separate disjoint uh, subgraphs. Uh, and they're all a subset of the original violated edges, but some violations will get lost along the way. Uh, some violations will get lost, but not all of them, so that I can still preserve the distance to monotonicity collectively. Okay, so given this theorem, uh, I'll show you uh, in one slide how I'm using the decomposition theorem to obtain uh, this inequality. Um, so we'll start with the 
left hand side of the inequality, which is the sum of the square root of the violations at each vertex. And at the very end, we're hoping to get a lower bound on distance to monotonicity of F. So I start with this quantity um, and I can lower bound it by only looking at the square root of the violations for those vertices X, which are in my subgraphs HI. This is clearly smaller than if I look at all vertices X in the original hypercube. And because the subgraphs HI are disjoint of each other, I can uh, decompose the sum into um, the sum over all subgraphs and then only looking at the sum of the violations within each subgraph. And uh, because all of the violations of the function fi are a subset of the violation of the original function, then I can lower bound this quantity of the square root of violations of f by the square root of the violations of the Boolean function fi. And note that all of the edges violated by fi are contained in H hi, so I can switch this hi to just be the entire hypercube. So from the Boolean case, I know that this uh, inner sum is lower bounded by the distance of the function to monotonicity times some constant that uh, comes from the original uh, Boolean inequality. And now because uh, I know that my uh, functions fi collectively preserve the distance to monotonicity of the original function, I can lower bound this by c over two of the distance to monotonicity of the original function. So in going from the Boolean inequality to the real valued case, we only lose a factor of two in the constant of that inequality. Um, okay, so this shows you how the main inequality for real valued functions is obtained. So now uh, the rest of the work is to prove this Boolean decomposition theorem. But before I go into proving the Boolean decomposition theorem, I also want to comment on why we need this complicated Boolean decomposition theorem as opposed to something easier. So if you're trying to prove this inequality for real valued functions, uh, you know there is one inequality for a Boolean function. The first attempt at reducing to the Boolean function would be via thresholding. So I start with my original function and I choose some threshold T and define the new Boolean function uh, whose value is one if uh, wherever the original function is greater than T and its value is zero wherever the original function is less than T. So for example, here I start with this real valued function. I choose a threshold of one and now I obtain a new Boolean function. And the violated edges of the Boolean function are going to be a subset of the original edges of the original violated edges of the real valued functions. But also you're going to lose some violated edges because of the violation. Okay, and here's how the argument would go um, with, if you just use the simple thresholding, you'd start with the square root of the violations of the original function. Uh, you can always lower bound this by the same quantity, but for the Boolean functions, because the violations are a subset of the violations of F. For the Boolean function, we know that this quantity is lower bounded by the distance of the Boolean function to monotonicity. And now the missing piece is to say, well, maybe I can find a threshold such that the distance of F to monotonicity is within a factor of the distance of this thresholded function to monotonicity. So is there such a good threshold? And the answer is no, we can construct a function so that its distance to monotonicity decreases by a factor of R, which is the size of the range for any threshold you pick. So the simple thresholding argument is not going to work. And what the Boolean decomposition theorem allows us to do is to just do more complicated thresholding, um, just applying different rules in different disjoint locations of the hypercube. Uh, okay. So having said that, uh, the rest of the talk is going to be about showing you how we prove this theorem. Um, so I'll just like stop for a second if there's questions. Um, 
but now the plan is to jump into the proof. Yeah, this is good. A good place to pause on this. Mm -hmm. uh, and your previous example shows that the real magic here is that you don't care about k in your theorem. Yeah, like you exactly. can choose k to be as large as you want, and it doesn't affect your bound, which seems kind of magical. Uh, why isn't it trivial to actually get very small subgraphs of just even a single edge each? Which which of the conditions will I not necessarily satisfy easily here? Uh, for each edge. So if I'm thinking um, I'm allowed to pick yeah, yeah, the distance super large. Right. And you're saying for each edge, sort of like uh, define a Boolean function for that edge. Um, okay, so the distance to monotonicity would be um, what, like the fact that you preserve the distance to monotonicity. I think actually, I th it's may maybe I phrased my question wrong. Maybe mm -hmm. what's actually going to stop me from using this trivial technique is that actually I, I might not be able to build Boolean functions that just have that edge. I can't easily just have a single edge be a violation, right? Um, that that too, yeah. So like you'd have to find a way to extend within uh, outside of that edge um, to make sure that, um, okay, so starting from that edge, you also want to make sure, yeah, you want to make sure that everything outside of that edge is not violated. Uh, so if that edge is like, sort of like towards the top of the hypercube, uh, I see. Or if it's somewhere in the it. middle. So, so yeah. this is why, so yeah, I'm, I'm trying to just get a handle of, mm why you don't lose anything from your function in, in this process. And I guess that's exactly why, is you can't just make a local decision not caring about what happens anywhere else. It, it's gonna have some trickle effect. Uh, yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. It still seems magical, but good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess we'll see how like this K is actually obtained and maybe it'll start to seem less magical. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So let's see. So, okay. So I want to define these functions so that they satisfy these like three conditions. So I'm going to slowly go through each of the separate conditions, but I'm first going to show you how we make uh, sure that the edges violated by FI are subs are all contained in like a very specific location of the hypercube. So this is the sort of like the issue that we were just talking about, like how do I make sure that I extend the function so that there's no violations outside of the hypercube? Okay, so our subgraphs HI are going to be defined in terms of two sets of vertices, SI and TI, uh, which we'll call a set pair. And SI is going to be, we think of as like lower vertices, TI as higher vertices. And the subgraph HI is going to be the union of all directed paths from the vertices in SI to the vertices in TI. And we call this a sweeping subgraph. So if these are all of the paths between the vertices uh, in SI to those in TI, then HI is going to contain all of those vertices and edges. And the nice thing about this definition is that if you look at the vertices outside of the sweeping subgraph, um, it's not too hard to see that these vertices cannot be both uh, what we call above and below the subgraph. So a vertex is above the subgraph if there is a path from a vertex in the subgraph to this vertex that's above, and it's below if uh, this vertex has a path to the subgraph. So a vertex can be either one of them. So this allows me to define my function outside of the subgraph in the following way. If the vertex Z is above the subgraph, then I'm going to set its value to one. If the vertex is uh, not above, so it's either below or neither, then I'm going to set its value to zero for, for all of the FIs. 
Um, and this guarantees that all of the edges that are outside of my sweeping subgraph are not violated. And there's some cases to check here, but I'll just show one. So if I have some edge that starts outside of the subgraph and goes inside, um, oops, uh, because the vertex is below the subgraph in this case, it will have value of zero. So it just cannot be violated if the lower endpoint has value of zero. Um, yeah, so with we're going to use the, so all of the HIs are going to be sweeping subgraphs and this sets SI and TI are to be determined. But this is how we satisfy this last condition, which is that all the edges violated by the Boolean function have to be contained in a sort of separate location. Okay, so next I'm going to show you how I uh, define those sets SI through TI to obtain my disjoint subgraphs and how I make sure that the distance to monotonicity is preserved. Um, so we're going to uh, define the sets SI and TI by starting with a matching of uh, pairs of sets S and T, which are subsets of the hypercube. And uh, the, a matching M will contain disjoint pairs X and Y of vertices such that X has a path, a uh, directed path to Y. And we say that a pair XY in the matching is violated if the value of X, um, a value of F of X is greater than the value of F of Y. So uh, starting, so if like I match these two vertices X and Y in my matching, then it's violated if somewhere along the path there is some violation. So the function starts uh, at a higher value and it decreases somewhere along the way. And the set pairs SI and TI are going to partition my matching. So the SIs are going to be subsets of S, the TIs are going to be subsets of T. And the reason that we consider matchings is because uh, they've been widely studied in relationship to monotonicity testing um, for every function F and a maximal matching of violated pairs. We have that the size of this maximal matches uh, approximates the distance to monotonicity within a factor of two. Um, the fact that it's the distance to monotonicity is at least the size of the maximal matching is because you have to at least change the value of each uh, of f at every pair in the matching to make it monotone. And the fact that it's at most two is by a connection between a vertex cover, the size of a vertex cover and the size of a maximal matching. Um, okay. So yeah, this is just like an example of like what a function values that look like for a violated pair in the matching. And what we want is some sort of partition um, of the matching uh, into uh, sort of this SITI pairs um, that will allow me to get the sweeping subgraphs. And because I'm starting with the matching, this will sort of allow me to preserve the distance to monotonicity of the original function. I should have said that this fact was first shown by Fischer, Lemma, Newman, Rasolnikov, and Rubinfeld. Okay, so here is how I'm going to obtain my partition. Um, recall that what I'm looking for is the sweeping subgraphs x, y, which are the subgraph of all paths from vertices in a set x to vertices in a set y. And I'm going to say that two uh, set pairs, x, y, and x prime, y prime conflict if their sweeping subgraphs uh, intersect each other, like uh, there's like a vertex or an edge that is path, part of both subgraphs. And uh, I'm going to start with my original matching and then decompose it into sort of small in, or partition it in the following way. I first have a collection of pairs S and T for all of the pairs S and T in the matching. So at first my partition is just like every pair is, is its own thing. And then I will look at the sweeping subgraph uh, formed by each pair in my matching. And if there is some conflict, so some overlap between two sweeping subgraphs, I will merge them. Uh, by merging is that I mean that I remove this 
I removed both of the pairs from my collection and then I add a new pair, which is the union of those. Uh, so just more like pictorially, if these two sweeping subgraphs uh, intersect with each other, I turn them into one sweeping subgraph. Then again, I look at the next sweeping subgraphs, they overlap. So I merge them and I keep doing this until there are no more overlaps. So eventually I now have my partition of the matching into this set pairs as INTI and the sweeping subgraphs for each of them are disjoint of each other by design. Um, so the value K is going to be, well, how many eventual um, part pieces do I partition my matching into? Now to show how we preserve the distance to monotonicity, we're not just going to use any matching, we're going to use a special matching M, which is um, a maximum weight and mean cardinality matching. Um, by maximum weight, we mean that it maximizes the sum of the values Fx minus Fy for every pair Xy in the matching. And then amongst the matchings that maximize weight, it has um, the fewest pairs uh, or yeah, the smallest cardinality. With this definition, we have that the matching M is maximal uh, because if I could add any other uh, violated pair, I would do so. And all pairs in M are violated because uh, if a pair I add is not violated, it contributes uh, positive it contributes a negative sum, uh, a negative quantity to my sum. Um, so the matching M is a matching, uh, a maximal matching of violated pairs, which is the kind of matchings we want for tracking the distance to monotonicity. And then I'm going to run this sort of meta algorithm of merging conflicts with my special matching M. Um, and the reason for choosing this matching is that it gives me a very nice eventual property of the set pairs. Um, and the property is the following. It says that for every set pair SITI, if I look at a vertex uh, X in the lower set SI and a vertex Y in the upper set TI, uh, such that there's a path from X to Y, then the value f of x is strictly greater than the value of f of y. So every time I have a directed path from a vertex in the bottom to a vertex in the top a set, um, there's going to be a violation there. Um, okay, so this is the only thing I do not prove. Um, so the violation lemma is going to sort of be taken for granted, um, but um, it follows from the choice of matching. So this is like one of the key tricks in the proof to choose like the right matching to look at. Um, and the reason we're going to use this violation lemma later on is to say that, okay, there is some like thresholding I can do along the way uh, from the bottom to the top set that allows me to preserve a violation to monotonicity. Um, okay, so yeah, uh, it will allow us to do some thresholding. Um, so let me show you how uh, I guarantee that the distance to monotonicity is preserved. Um, I'll define my function fi in the following way. Its value is going to be one for all of the vertices in the lower set si, and it's going to be zero um, for all of the vertices in the set ti. Um, so therefore, Fi has some matching of violated pairs from the vertices in the bottom to the vertices in the top. And this matching is a restriction of the original matching of violated pairs to this specific sweeping subgraph, Hi. And uh, also because all, all the sweeping subgraphs are disjoint from each other, then the matchings themselves uh, are disjoint of each, from each other. So if I look at the distance to monotonicity of my function fi, it's going to be lower bounded by the size of this matching mi. And then uh, collectively for all of the functions fi I define, the sizes of these matchings give me the size of the original matching m. 
uh, which itself gives me a lower bound on the distance, an upper bound on the distance of f to monotonicity. Um, so by defining this functions fi in terms of the matchings, I am able to preserve the distance to monotonicity of the function. Okay. So the only property that is left to show is that the uh, I can define my functions fi so that the violations are a subset of the violations of the original function. Um, and I've shown you how I define the function outside of the sweeping subgraph. I've shown you what is defined as in SI and in TI, but I haven't told you what I do inside. Sorry, can I just ask mm -hmm. a quick question there? Yeah. Um, so how do you, uh, I think you may, may have said this, but how do you justify that the originals matching S and T like um, preserves this distance of at least one half? Like I'm trying to picture that and that seems, mm -hmm. I feel like there could be a lot of violated edges outside of, the original matching S and T. Okay, so the matching of violations is maximal. Uh, so you cannot add any more violations to it. Uh, and the reason that the a maximal matching gives you a sort of like a approximation on the distance to monotonicity is first of all, for the lower bound. Um, if I have all of these violated pairs, I need to change the value of F on at least some. Uh, some like at least in one point in each pair. And then for uh, the other side, the upper bound, uh, a maximal matching is within a factor of two of a ver the size of a vertex cover. So now I'm looking at um, a vertex cover of all of the violated, uh, sort of, of the graph of all of the violated pairs. Let me make this more clear, yeah. So if I look at all of the violated pairs in my graph and I add and I construct this new graph, which has an edge for each violated pair, then I look at its vertex cover. The size of the vertex cover gives me a bound on the distance to monotonicity. Uh, in fact, I think it gives you the distance to monotonicity exactly. So if you change uh, one vertex in each, uh, each vertex in the vertex cover, you make the function monotone. Okay. Sorry, this so is com complicated without a picture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so the idea is that there's not like there's not going to be too many, like for one, S and T are disjoint, right? Yes. And then there's not going to be too many violated pairs like within T. Is that right? Uh, so. So why are you asking about whether there's violated pairs within T? Um, like, I guess the argument would be that there can't be too many violated pairs within T because those would not be included. Um, uh, okay. I think it's like easier to just think about the vertex cover of the violations. Uh, so like the maximal matching is not going to capture everything. It's not going to capture all of the violations, but we know that any matching, any maximal matching is within a factor of two of the vertex cover. So okay, okay, uh, that makes sense. the vertex cover is what captures all, the, all of the violations. Right, okay, thanks. Yeah. Let me check time. Um, I started at 9.30. Okay, so oh, I'll skip the summary here. <laughs> um, so I'll just show you the last missing piece, which is how I define uh, the function fi within the sweeping subgraph. Um, so for each vertex z in the sweeping subgraph, I'm going to look at an individual threshold for this point z, and the threshold is going to be the following. I look at all of the vertices y that are above z in the set ti. And then I take the maximum value of f amongst those vertices. If f of z is even bigger than this maximum, I'll define its value fi of z as one. And if it's smaller than this uh, maximum, I'll define its value fi of z as zero. Um, so there's like for each vertex z, I have some individual threshold in rule. Okay, I'll show this with a picture so that it's easier. So um, let's see, like imagine you have some path from a vertex in SI to a vertex in TI. 
if I look at the vertex D that's in TI and I look at all of the vertices that are above D, well, D itself is above D. So this maximum value here is always going to be uh, is always going to be greater than f of d. So for all of the vertices in Ti, uh, fi of those vertices will be zero. Uh, and this is how I wanted to define my function, anyways. Now, if I look at the vertex C and I look at all of the vertices above C in my set TI, that's going to also contain the vertices that were above D because there's a path from C to D. And now I'm taking the max over a bigger set. So uh, the max increases. And then as I go down this path, uh, B has an even bigger set of vertices above it than C. Uh, and so does A. So this uh, threshold that I'm looking at keeps increasing down the path. So for D, I apply the lowest threshold. For A, I apply the highest threshold. And this violation lemma that I talked about earlier um, tells me that for all of the vertices that are above A, all of their uh, F of A is greater than f of all of those vertices above a. So I can define fi of a to be one. And um, so for the vertices in si, their value is always going to be one. For the vertices in ti, their value will always be zero. And along the path, I apply a threshold in rule that uh, is the highest in si and keeps decreasing or keeps potentially decreasing. Um, okay, so now I need to show this final property that the violations of Fi are a subset of the violations of F. Um, so let's consider any edge x, y within the subgraph and suppose it's a viol and suppose it's violated, then this means that Fi of x is equal to one and Fi of y is equal to zero. Um, and this smaller triangle, I'm looking at all the vertices that are above y. And in this bigger triangle, I'm looking at all of the vertices that are above x. Now, because um, fi of x is defined as one, it means that the value of f of x is greater than the value of f at all of these vertices above x. And because I'm looking at the max, then when I look at the vertices that are above just y, this max is going to be uh, less than or equal to the max when I look at the vertices above x. Um, and because f of y is defined to be zero, then this uh, max for the vertices above y is uh, greater than or equal to f of y. So now I have that f of x is strictly greater than f of y. So it means that the edge x, y must have been violated by f. So I'll give like a brief summary of how this like meta algorithm for obtaining this decomposition works. So I start with some matching of violated pair that is maximum weight and minimum cardinality. And then I run my algorithm um, of merging conflicts, which obtains disjoint set pairs S i through T i that partition my original matching. And uh, for each set pair S i T i, I look at the subgraph of all the paths between these two sets and their vertex is joined. And then the way I define my function F i is outside of the subgraph, it's one for all those vertices above the subgraph, zero for all those vertices that are below. In S i, its value is always one. In T i, its value is always zero. And then for the vertices that are sort of Within the subgraph, I use some thresholding rule. Um, it's a very uh, individual thresholding rule to define Fi. Okay, so this concludes the proof of the decomposition theorem, which gives me the main inequality that I wanted. Uh, okay, and I only need one or two more minutes to conclude. <laughs> That's okay. Go for it. There's no rush. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Um, so what we showed in this talk is that uh, we're able to improve uh, upper bounds on uh, Fourier complexity and approximation factor of sublinear algorithms for monotonicity of real valued functions. We generalize isoperimetric inequalities that were known for Boolean functions to real valued functions. And to do that, we prove a Boolean decomposition theorem, uh, which allows us to reduce from the real valued case to the Boolean case. Um, and it works actually for any type of pulse set and not just the hypercube. So one open question that I'm going to leave you with is, um, do the isoperimetric inequalities hold for other kind of domains, not just the hypercube? So specifically the hypergrids and to the D, which generalizes the hypercube is another domain where monotonicity testing has been widely studied. And Black, Chakrabarty, and Sashadri showed that the Margulis type inequalities, so the weaker ones hold on the hypergrid domain. But does the Talagrand one hold as well? Is there like a way to generalize it so that it holds? And um, I'm, yeah, so it would suffice to show this inequality for the Boolean case. And you can, again, use our Boolean decomposition theorem to generalize this inequality to real valued functions and obtain um, improved algorithms for monotonicity testing on the hypergrid. So, there's currently, there is an upper bound known for testing monotonicity on hypergrids, but it's, it very much seems like it's not the correct upper bound. Oops, okay. So yeah, that's all I had for today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, maybe the first thing I can say, we, we, we should ask questions, but mm -hmm. especially since we're a small group, I should have asked at the mm -hmm. very beginning, you can turn on your cameras, everybody, you can oh. say hi. <laughs> and, uh, we can stop the recording and you can, uh, that way we can ask some very tough questions that you can answer <laughs> pure guesses or <laughs> yeah. anything that won't have a record. Hi, everyone. Hello, thanks for the great talk. Maybe I'll ask the first question. Mm -hmm. So, um, I guess I missed if you if you explicitly said it or not, but do we expect that the same um, technique should also give uh, inequalities for real value functions in the undirected case, like the classic undirected inequalities? Or, or like, is that easy to see, or do we even expect it? For the hypergrid, you mean? For the or... well, for the hypercube, just like um, I guess a telegram oh, okay, okay, inequality okay. for the undirected hypercube for real value real value functions. Uh, right, yeah, so well, what I showed much earlier in the presentation, so probably got lost right now, is that there is a undirected version of Talagrand for real valued functions on the undirected hypercube. And uh, the lower bound is in terms of the distance of the function to a constant function. So that's like uh, how many, the least number of values of f that I need to change to make the function constant. And that proof is, uh, for the undirected case is way easier than the directed case. So you don't need this Boolean decomposition theorem. You can actually just do the simple thresholding. Uh, so you just pick one threshold and it works in this case. Okay, I see, thanks. But then the same technique fails for the directed yes. version. Yes, yeah. What if I tried to prove the undirected case using your decomposition theorem approach? Like, try the complicated way, even though there's a much easier way. Mm -hmm. What would happen? Is there even a way to kind of... Uh, walk through the steps here okay so <clears throat> yeah you're starting with a function that's non-constant and you're trying to make it constant um, yeah i see so you're saying the I guess the fact yeah, that we I don't guess, even obviously have the matching kind of stops us. Yeah, in the very yeah. First step. yeah, it's very like monotonicity oriented, I guess, the technique. 
you could try a matching of non um, non constant pairs, but I don't know if that gives you uh, does it give you like a yeah, I guess that could approximate the distance to constant. Perhaps a better question, though, then. So your Boolean decomposition theorem. I guess there's like a meta theorem uh, or a more general one than the ones you stated, like you were mentioning that essentially any isoparametric type inequality for Boolean values will extend to real valued functions. So Boolean uh... valued functions to is that true? No, no, that, no, that's too too strong. So what I said is that our de Boolean decomposition theorem, which is very specific for like, as we said, like if you're looking at like monotonicity, like you're trying to preserve distance to monotonicity, it works for any pulse set. So not just the hypercube, but hypergrids um, and whatever do kind of domain people would like to study. Um, where but they so would it, study, like, it applies both to the Margulis type inequality and the Telegram inequality, like the directed versions of both those inequalities. Um, Is that true? Can you use it for both or just the... Oh, I see, I see what you mean. Um, yeah, can you use it to prove the Margulis or the real valued case? Uh, Probably. Actually, I need to think what the Margulis like looks like for the direct for the real valid case, but probably looks the same. Yeah, I, th I think you could probably use it to prove the Margulis uh, inequality. But I haven't really thought about the Margulis type for real valued functions. Yeah, I'm trying to just picture what the real most general view of your decomposition theorem should be. Uh... And I guess the most guess... ambitious one I want to say <laughs> is any inequality where on the left hand side you have something about the monotonicity. Uh, the, or on one of the sides you have distance to monotonicity, and on the other side you have some function of the yeah. uh, violations then yeah. you can convert that from Boolean to real valued. Yes. Uh, or any type of domain. Domain. Yeah, on any domain. This is mm -hmm. very nice. It's very general. Yeah, and I guess, yeah, it's really sort of interesting to see what happens with other kinds of domains. Uh, it's like much harder, a much harder question to study for sure. Um, yeah. From just having attempted it. <laughs> uh, Alex, Cameron, if you have more questions, sorry, I don't want to monopolize this. Or Renato as well, if you have more questions. Um, yeah, nice, nice talk, by the way. Um, I didn't have a specific question about the decomposition theorem, but just like some general questions about the monotonicity tester. Mm -hmm. um, so like, maybe this is obvious, but I, I haven't seen the results of how to take the isoparametric inequality and turn into a tester, but yeah. Um, so you had this like dependence on R. So I think it was like R times square root D or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess in, in general, like R could be like exponential in D. So like, um, or I guess you had the min of R times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you're assuming right. that R is uh, bounded by, or like our improved result is only really improved when R is at most root D. Right. So would you get something if like your function um, has a large image, but say it's like very close to something with a small image? In other words, like start with a function that has a very small image and then like just add a little bit of noise to it. Um, Mm -hmm. then is it I know you have the lower bound but like do you know what I mean 
Um, okay, so start with a function that has a small image size. Uh, and then you're like adding this noise that makes it look like a function with a large image size, but you're saying your tester should still like work even for this function with like a large image size. Uh, um. I'm just curious, or like does the mm -hmm. lower bound some, would the lower bound somehow be able to like exploit that fact, even if the, like for whatever small noise parameter you could come up with some bad example. Yeah, yes. I'm not sure, but it's definitely interesting because somehow the image size can be made. Or I guess the question is like, can you really perturb this image size and still preserve like the same monotonicity structure of the function where it's like the same distance and this like the violations are in the same places like could it be that it's mm -hmm. even simpler i i, I really mm -hmm. like that question so yeah. i can't resist jumping yeah. in <laughs> yeah of course. so you're saying it should be like the effective range in some sense is the real measure not the real range and i kind of want to say it should be but let's see if my reasoning is correct or if uh, i'm just yeah. on friday afternoon mode if you just change a, a some constant fraction of the values of the function just to increase the range a lot but only on a very small number of points that shouldn't affect very much how a tester behaves on this function right uh, just because with few queries with high probability, you won't even query any of the points that you've changed. Uh, so even if you throw in the towel and you say, oh, the, the tester made a mistake whenever it queried one of those points that you changed, uh, that still won't change the acceptance or rejection, rejection probability very much. Mm. Is that true? I think that's true okay so what you're saying uh, okay it's not the size of the range but it's like some related quantity uh, the effective size of the range which is or yeah how are you thinking about effective size of the range in this case uh i guess it's the minimum range size of a function that's actually very close to your original function where I don't know exactly what we can say about very close. Yeah. Or um, for maybe, it's, maybe it's something like the effective range where like the smallest number of values you can use to keep the same structure of violations. Um, in your function. Very randomly, might it be something like entropy? Ooh. Alex, you're saying it should be related to entropy, maybe? No, not should be, but like it might. Might be? Yeah. Hmm. Because I'm thinking if you have like a bunch of numbers with very low frequency, then it wouldn't contribute to the entropy much. uh wait what what are we measuring the entropy of i like that idea that sounds cool mm. because we're putting buzzwords together uh, <laughs> how are you measuring the entropy you're looking at the, looking at the distribution over the um, ranges of values so then if i have lots of values that are very rare but not too many values so that there's still a very small fraction of the total probability mass, then yes, you're right. Then that contributes very little to the entropy. Mm -hmm. uh, ooh, like that would be D. nice if that was the, the right way to look at it.
Uh, and, and got us. Okay. And I, I, I was thinking about this much simpler than I think what what you're thinking of, Eden. I, mm -hmm. I, I'm not even thinking of preserving the actual violation structure, mm. the function everywhere. Uh, I'm just saying, or the way I'm picturing it is mm -hmm. if I mess up the graph in, or the function at, at a small number of points, uh, probably I won't even notice because I won't look at those small those number points. of points. Uh, so even though the violations have changed in some way, they've changed in a way that doesn't really matter for the algorithm in the end. Right. Uh, mm. And my argument for this is just kind of a, a, a trivial argument. To, well, one that's been used before also to show that any standard property tester has a tiny amount of tolerance as mm. long as the query complexity is very small. Right. Uh, I've never stopped to think whether this could actually be captured properly by entropy or by some natural measure of complexity as opposed to what I was proposing for the definition, the, uh, the really terrible of just find the closest function that has a small range. So yeah, that could be interesting. Right. But so you're saying closest function that has a smaller range, but you're not trying to preserve any sort of structure by finding the closest function. Yeah. Just arguing that as long as you're close enough, you've preserved enough structure that mm -hmm. it's okay. I see. Um, yeah, that's definitely interesting. So I think for like the more sort of stringent definition that I gave, gave where it's like the size of the range, the smallest size of the range that keeps the same structure of violations, I think that's kind of like the right R to look at. Um, and I disagree. No, <laughs> no, I, I'm not saying it's the right one. I'm saying like if you use that, you'll you'll get the same results basically. The but, the, uh, the clean yeah. exact same. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Um, and then, right, there should definitely be room for switching the values, like perturbing the values a little bit. Um, Yeah, what's interesting is I, I I'm not aware of any work that's done this. So yeah, 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 there's definitely been quite a bit of work on this parametrized complexity with putting in the range size itself. But mm -hmm. yeah, it'd be interesting if you can say yeah, that's not that's not the tightest thing you can put. Like we can always strengthen this. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Cool. Any other questions? Uh, uh, just a quick question. I, glancing at the paper, um, I saw that there was also, uh, you also give like those robust versions of the inequalities that are actually yeah. needed for the multinicity tester. And yeah. I was just curious, do those versions kind of follow very easily once you have the decomposition theorem or do you have to do some extra work for those? Oh, actually, yeah, that's nice. That's what, uh, so here's where what Eric was saying. So yeah, basically like this decomposition theorem kind of works for any isoperimetric inequality that has distance to monotonicity. Um, so this isoperimetric inequality, which is stronger, like the robust version, uh, follows in the same way from the Boolean case using this decomposition theorem. So there's no additional work. Um, and then to catch up other people, the more robust version of this inequality, um, basically, so I said, when we count the violations, we don't want to double count them. So I'm just going to count them on the lower end point of the violated edges. But I could also count them on the higher end point. So this would give me like different values for the quantity, like for the same function, like the left-hand side of my inequality would look different based on where I count the edges. Uh, and then a even more generalized version is like, well, for each edge, I'm going to tell you where I want to count it. And then uh, the same inequality holds.
um, so it's a stronger one that you need for the yeah for the monotonicity tester to have the right query complexity. Thanks. Last chance for questions. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this would now usually be the time where we'd get to say, okay, now we can uh, go have coffee, go have coffee, <laughs> go have some cakes, some cookies oh. or something healthy. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, this doesn't really work as well online. So we'll have to take a, a rain check for this. Next yeah. time we're all in the same physical location, we'll have to do this at a conference or, uh, or in the Bay Area or Boston. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, thank you very much for the discussion, everyone. This is really interesting. And uh, thank you for having me. And it was really great to meet all of you. Hopefully I'll run into you in person at some point. Yeah, thank you so much for your talk. This was great. Yeah, yeah. it's great to meet you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.